Straight ahead on Law and Crime Daily. We ask you to give Mr. Depp his life back by telling the world that Mr. Depp is not the abuser Ms. Heard said he is and hold Ms. Heard accountable for her lies. Closing arguments are presented in the case of Johnny Depp versus Amber Heard and Depp's team calls Heard's allegations a vicious lie. Ms. Heard's claim that the op-ed is not about Mr. Depp is just another one of her many, many lies. Plus, Amber Heard's attorneys fight for their client. And you cannot simultaneously protect and uphold the First Amendment and find in favor of Johnny Depp on this claim. You simply cannot. And later, a breakdown of Amber Heard's counterclaim. You can find whatever Mr. Waldman's done, and you can find whatever Mr. Depp has done. And both of those are the same for purposes of evaluating the verdict form. Law and Crime Daily covering court cases from coast to coast. Welcome everyone to Law and Crime Daily. I'm your host, Brian Buckmeyer. Closing arguments in the Johnny Depp versus Amber Heard case are presented six years to the day after Amber Heard filed for a temporary restraining order from then-husband Johnny Depp. Law and Crime's Angela Levy was inside the courtroom for closing arguments Friday. Anjanette? Brian, you know, it was May 27th, 2016, when Amber Heard went to the courthouse in Los Angeles and filed for that domestic relations, domestic violence restraining order against Johnny Depp. You know, this was a, a turning point for Johnny Depp. This is when his attorneys say the giant lie began. The paparazzi was at the courthouse, and this made international news. So let's talk about the giant lie at the heart of this case. Ms. Heard's claim that Mr. Depp is an abusive monster and that she is a public figure representing domestic abuse. At the start of this case, Mr. Chu and I told you that you were going to hear some disturbing and graphic tales of abuse from Ms. Heard, and they were designed to shock you and overwhelm you. We told you that this would be a performance, the role of her lifetime, as a heroic survivor of brutal abuse. When Mr. Depp brought this case for defamation, Ms. Heard went all in. She spun a story of shocking, overwhelming, brutal abuse. She came into this courtroom prepared to give the performance of her life, and she gave it. Ms. Heard's acting coach, Christina Sexton, testified that Ms. Heard has difficulty crying when she is acting. You saw it. Ms. Heard sobbing without tears while spinning elaborate, exaggerated, fantastical accounts of abuse and everything going on in her mind almost a decade prior while enduring that abuse. It was a performance. She told you what she thinks you need to hear to convict this man as a domestic abuser and a rapist. And Camille Vasquez didn't mention this in her closing argument, but it had come up in testimony during the trial. May 27th is not only the date that Amber Heard requested that domestic violence restraining order, it's also the birthday of Johnny Depp's daughter, Lily Rose. And we heard testimony that Lily Rose did not like Amber Heard. So you have to wonder if that date was purely a coincidence, given, given what's being alleged in this case by the Depp team, that this was all an elaborate hoax. Brian. And Jeanette, so you were in the courtroom. Tell us about what you heard in the lawyer's voice as they argued in summation, the reaction of the jury, and even the audience as closing arguments were being made. You know, I think it was uh, interesting because I've, I've been in the courtroom, obviously, before, and this was different. Um, you know, it, it's a serious mood in there all, at all times, uh, but this felt heavier this morning for some reason. Um, it, it felt more serious and... Um, you know, I don't know how to describe it. It was just a heavy feeling. And everybody was very quiet. Um, there have been some times where people have, you know, chit-chatted and things like that, but it was just really quiet. And then Camille Vasquez got up to uh, start her closing argument. The jurors smiled at her um, pretty broadly, and then they listened. Uh, they listened intently. I didn't see any of them taking notes, uh, which was interesting because they took a lot of notes, obviously, during the trial and during the testimony. Uh, but they seemed very engaged 
question what she had to say. Um, but they've been—a lot of them have been kind of stone-faced, and I felt like they were pretty stone-faced to today as well, at least from where I was sitting. Yeah. Now, it, it, I, think, I guess this is a million-dollar question. When do you think we'll get a verdict? And what issue do you think the jury will grapple with the most uh, when trying to come up with a heads or tails of this case? I always hate to make predictions about verdicts. Um, sometimes I'm right and sometimes I'm wrong. You know, it's kind of like spitballing. Um, but, you know, there's just no telling. Uh, Judge Askarati told the jurors she would let them deliberate in into the evening if they if they wished. But, but she also told them, I don't order dinner, so be aware of that. Also, uh, we are on the, you know, cusp of a holiday weekend. It's Memorial Day weekend. So you have to wonder, is this jury really going to want to stay at the courthouse late? Uh, also, uh, there was a woman dismissed from the jury, uh, along with a man. So um, that means there are two women now on this jury and five men. And there are some, you know, a, a, there are different age ranges involved here. Some of these are younger men, and the women. Uh, one of the women appeared to be kind of in her, maybe in her 50s, and then there was a younger woman. So. Um, you know, the, people have different life experiences. It's really, it's really hard to understand or, or wonder or put yourselves in their shoes to wonder what they're, you know, what they're dealing with and what they're focusing on. Absolutely. Well, we're all curious about what they're focusing on. And Jeanette, stick with us. We'll be back in a moment. Still ahead on Law and Crime Daily, a closer look at the closing argument presented for Johnny Depp. This case for Mr. Depp has never been about him. Nor is it, about, is it about punishing Ms. Hearn. It is about Mr. Depp's reputation and freeing him from the, pr the prison in which he has lived for the last six years, I and mean, it's six years to the day. Ahead, the culmination of the Johnny Depp Amber Heard trial as attorney Benjamin Chu rounds out closing arguments for Depp's side. Welcome back to Law and Crime Daily. We're taking a closer look now at Depp's closing argument, presented in part by attorney Ben Chu. Chu told jurors Depp's reputation is forever tarnished because of a vicious lie. Mr. Depp has millions of fans, people who, have heard, who grew up watching him on 21 Jump Street, which is something you heard Miss Heard mock on one of the tapes that was played to you. Or they grew up watching him play the swashbuckling pirate Captain Jack Sparrow in the Pirates of the Caribbean movies, or Willy Wonka. Mr. Depp means something to those people, and those people mean a lot to Mr. Depp. He's a fond memory from childhood or adolescence, or adulthood. And to tarnish him as an abuser is to destroy him in the eyes of many of these people who will never look at him the same way again. And because of what Ms. Heard did, and because of what she said, Mr. Depp will go to his grave knowing, matter, knowing no matter what he does, no matter the outcome of this trial, there are people who used to look up to him who now believe that he beat a woman, which is the worst thing you can say about a man. And he did not and does not deserve to have his life, his legacy, destroyed by a vicious lie. The lies have grown and metastasized over time, and they need to be stopped. And those false accusations have caused more harm to Mr. Depp than her fists ever did. Joining us today is defense attorney Matthew Mangino, co-host Terry Austin, and law and crime correspondent Anjanette Levy. Matt, I was actually not a fan of this argument by Chu. I actually expected Heard's lawyers to argue that some people can separate their childhood love of characters like Jack Sparrow, and that's maybe why uh, they are lying on his behalf, but that didn't happen. So my question for you is, was this closing convincing enough to sway a juror that may believe Heard? Well, there's a couple of things that I was concerned about with regard to this closing. Number one is this idea of hero worship. I mean, he, they're almost condoning that, hey, people love Johnny Depp, and they'll do anything for Johnny Depp, and they'll say anything for, for Johnny Depp. The other problem is that they said that his reputation is forever tarnished. Well, you're not going to get your reputation back if it's forever tarnished. So this is about money. 
And, and they're trying to say on one hand, hey, this isn't about money, it's about his reputation. But you've already conceded that his reputation is tarnished and he's never going to get it back. So what is this case about? Uh, so it, it was an interesting sort of dichotomy in, in their closing that, that struck me uh, kind of strange. Yeah, I thought they had a lot of stronger arguments there that kind of passed on them. Terry, do you think how Vasquez and Chu divided the closing worked to their benefit? I do. I think it was a great strategy. We know that Camille Vasquez focused on Amber Heard. She walked that jury through what <clears throat> happened. One thing I said before, and I'll say it again, I think they should have had a demonstrative to show what dates things happened and what the claims were. But she walked them through it, and she showed that jury that she lied the entire time. And I think that made sense because it was Camille Vasquez who cross-examined Amber Heard. And then I think it made total sense for Ben Chu to actually do the law, to talk about what it takes to find defamation, and to also walk the jury through the verdict form. That's critical so they understand what they are looking at when they get behind closed doors. Yeah. And Jeanette, what's going on in Fairfax County, Virginia? Has anything else happened in or outside the courthouse since the jury got the case? You know, the only thing that's really happened, Brian, um, you know, as we've been telling you each day, people, when Johnny Depp leaves the courthouse, they line the street behind the courthouse and they cheer for him. He waves. Uh, the crowds have been huge and they've just grown since the beginning of the trial. That crowd then kind of migrates to the front of the courthouse and uh, they're gathered there right now and they are waiting for the lawyers, uh, for Johnny Depp's lawyers to exit the courthouse. So uh, they've been doing this as well, gr uh, coming to show support for his attorneys. Uh, we don't see that same level of support for Amber Heard and her lawyers. They leave uh, a different way. All right. Let's see what happens with this crowd as we go into verdict watch, waiting to see how this jury, I think you said five men and two women, decide this case. Thank you very much, Anjanette. Coming up on Law & Crime Daily, the Johnny Depp Amber Heard defamation trial inches towards the finish line. This trial is about so much more than Johnny Depp versus Amber Heard. It's about the freedom of speech. Stand up for it, protect it, and reject Mr. Depp's claims against Amber. Up next, Amber Heard's attorneys take the floor to present their summation of the case before the jury. Welcome back. After six weeks of testimony, jurors hear final arguments from Amber Heard's attorneys. J. Benjamin Rottenborn told the jury Depp's team is victim-blaming and that this case is about the First Amendment and freedom of speech. Trying to convince you that Mr. Depp has carried his burden of proof in proving that he was never abusive to Amber on even one occasion, think about the message that Mr. Depp his attorneys are sending to Amber and by extension to every victim of domestic abuse everywhere. If you didn't take pictures, it didn't happen. If you did take pictures, they're fake. If you didn't tell your friends, you're lying. And if you did tell your friends, they're part of the hoax. And if you finally decide that enough is enough, you've had enough of the fear, enough of the pain, and you have to leave to save yourself, you're a gold digger. Your key question to answer is, does the First Amendment give Ms. Heard the right to write the words that she wrote in this article on December 18th, 2018? That's the question. And you cannot simultaneously protect and uphold the First Amendment and find in favor of Johnny Depp on his claim. You simply cannot. You have to decide, should someone be able to write an article like that in the United States of America without being sued successfully, without having to go through the hell that Ms. Heard has gone through? It is time to tell Mr. Depp that this was his last chance. Tell him to move on with his life. Tell him to let Amber move on with hers. Stand up for the freedom of speech. Stand up for the First Amendment. Terry, maybe it's the criminal defense attorney in me, but arguing burdens first when your client is an alleged victim of intimate partner violence felt like a weak start to a closing to me. What did you think? 
You know, I totally understand your point, but I think it was actually a clever way to flip the narrative. I was impressed by the way he laid that out. He told the jury, if you believe depth, then you're sending a message to Amber and others who are true victims that unless you have photographs, unless you have tapes, unless you went to the physician, unless all of these things, then it didn't happen. Now, the problem there is you start thinking, well, hmm, maybe that's true. But here, Amber Heard said so many lies. She's not a true victim if you believe that all of these are lies. So if she were a true victim, then those issues would be a problem. And I did think it was pretty clever the way he flipped that switch on that jury to make the depth team look like they were trying to hide something. Well, let's see if that switch works. Matt, the strongest part of Heard's case, at least in my opinion, is that Ron Bourne is right to say that the jury only needs to believe one act of violence occurred. But do all jurors have to agree on the same alleged act? And is that possible? I don't think that that's the case uh, here, um, Brian, because this isn't a criminal case where you have to prove the elements of, say, aggravated assault, you know, uh, an intent to cause serious bodily injury. And it has to be, obviously, a specific act. Here, this is a defamation case. And what he, what, what uh, Johnny Depp's position is, is that he's never abused Amber Heard. And therefore, anything that she said is defamatory when it comes to abuse. And if you can prove, whether it be one instance of abuse or one instance that one person believes and another instance that another person believes on that jury, that's going to be enough because you don't have to prove a specific element of abuse that you normally would or, or assault that you normally would in a criminal prosecution. Now, that makes a lot of sense, Matt. My only question is, was that clear enough to the jury? And how long is it going to take for them to kind of parse through that? We might be here for some days, but we'll be <laughs> here following each and every step. When we come back, Amber Heard's counterclaim explained. Plus... But what would Amber Heard's motive be for creating a hoax or creating any of this or making any of this up? That's a big question here. Hear Heard's closing argument presented by Elaine Brendenhoff. Welcome back to Law and Crime Daily. As part of Heard's closing argument, Elaine Brendenhoff narrowed in on the counterclaim and the statements made by Depp's attorney, Adam Waltman. With respect to the malice on this one, you know he knows that he did these things. You know that he knows he was out of it for three days. And that's all that we need to prove for malice. But there's a couple of more facts here. But you can find whatever Mr. Waldman's done, and you can find whatever Mr. Depp has done. And both of those are the same for purposes of evaluating the verdict form. They stand in each other's shoes. When you have an agent, and that's what the jury instructions say, you can go with both. What did Mr. Waldman do? There was an article about the sexual violence that he had put from the April one that went into the trial. Amber's testimony, she was sitting near him in the trial. Adam Waldman threw that newspaper down in front of her de defiantly. That's actual malice. Remember, he's the one that after the UK trial went to the LAPD with a notebook full of things and tried to get perjury charges against Amber. The LAPD said, we don't investigate those things. Um, but he then went to a German newspaper and said, Amber is being investigated by the NYPD, or the uh, LAPD, for perjury. Do you remember that? That's malice. That's showing his intent to do harm to Amber. Uh, he also admitted that he speaks to that umbrella guy, and you'll see that one text in there from the person from TMZ. That umbrella guy is the big lead of Johnny Depp's, you know, positive uh, uh, social media that is putting all the negative out on Amber, Amber Heard. Uh, and he also ended up getting knocked out of Twitter because he was abusing Amber. Jurors are finished deliberating on Friday. Just after two hours of having the case, they'll be back on Tuesday at 9 a.m. Eastern time to continue with deliberations. Make sure to stay with Law and Crime Network for a live broadcast when jury questions and ultimately the verdict is read. Matt, Brenda Hoff's definition of actual malice was 
actually off. Could that hurt her when the jury compares the definition to her arguments while deliberating? Well, um, you know, it, it is a bit off, but, you know, it, as long as the court doesn't give a curative instruction, I don't believe there is going to be any curative instruction uh, about the way she presented that during her closing, then I don't think the jury is going to focus much attention on it. In fact, they're trying to figure out what their responsibility is right now. I mean, you have very detailed jury instructions. Uh, you have 23 days of testimony. You have these closing arguments. You have all these things swirling in their head. I think they're, they're going to be more focused on some of the fundamental issues in this case than to get distracted by what may have not been a completely accurate definition. Although we all know that in law school they teach us, you know, child uh, uh, trial advocacy 101, you know, don't, uh, you know, misquote the, the, the statute uh, because that can always come back and be harmful to your case. But here I don't think in the grand scheme of things it's going to make that much of a difference to jurors. All right, we'll see when the jurors come out. Terry Brennerhoff seemed to rush through her closing, understandably, because they only had six minutes for rebuttal. How will time management affect this trial? Time management affects everything, Brian. Listen, we know for a fact that the herd team took too much time during the trial and during the closing. And when you have to rush, it's not as important to the jury. So they should have saved some of that time. All right, we're rushing out of here now as well. Thank you both. And thank you for joining us here on Law & Crime Daily. We'll see you next time as we discuss justice in America.